With the exception of the family, please stand for the invocation. Let us pray. Gracious God, Divine Father, Heavenly Mother, thank you for the presence of your spirit that is in this place. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the life of Sister Bertha Maxwell Roddy. To all that are participating, I pray that they will give themselves permission to totally decrease as you work in and through us during this celebration of life. I ask this prayer in the matchless name of Jesus to Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. You may be seated. Testament lesson is Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, from the New Revised Standard Version. Let us hear a word from the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? with ten thousands of rivers of oil. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The voice of the Lord cries to the city, 
It is sound wisdom to fear your name. Hear, O tribe and assembly of the city. Amen. Good afternoon. Our New Testament reading will be coming from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. And I'll be reading from the New Reverse Standard Version of the Bible. If I speak in tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in the part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, and the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child, I spoke as a child and, and thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a matter of dimly, but then we will face to then we will see face to face. Now I only now I only in part. I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, love, abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. bow in a moment of silence. Please allow us to feel the divine presence and comfort of your Holy Spirit. Lord, a few of your believing children have assembled here in this sacred place. First and foremost, Lord, we want to thank you for the soul that you allowed us to experience all of these years. And each and every Sunday when she came in, whether she knew where she was going, she knew where she was going to sit. And for as long as she was able, that was her number one priority on Sunday morning. And for that, Lord, we just say thank you to those who were caregivers that made sure she got here and the other places as the health declined. Tearfully, a lot of times because there was nothing they could do, but they kept coming and they kept bringing her. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. For all of those young lives, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, cousins and others she taught how important it was for them to know their family and their history and their heritage. And she lived it, she didn't just talk it, but she lived it. And she made so many of us understand how valuable 
it was to understand and love who we are. For that, Lord, we say thank you. For all those young college students and high school students, particularly those young girls who so often didn't have a father or a mother, but they felt comfortable to come and, and share with her their pain. I'm sure sometimes she cried with them. And some of those women are still around, some in this room that she mentored and comforted in the most dire times in their lives when nobody else cared. Lord, we just say thank you. And for all those who assembled here and those who are streaming and others that knew her in their own special way, that somehow, some way, she imparted something in all of us that that part that she left would never die. And we just say thank you, Lord, for her life. We thank you for everything that she showed us about being a woman of class, esteem and great hope for the future we ask our father as we assemble here this day you help us to be reminded of the beauty of a woman that stood strongly against the wall and said i am god's child and for that i will serve him in spirit and in truth and she did until she met her last day we ask that you would be with our pastor as he reached deep in his heart and his spirit to bring a word of comfort and resolve that because we know the Lord and she knew the Lord, she's resting now in that peaceful place where we all desire. But for those of us who are still here, we grieve, we cry, but when all is dried and done, we survive because we know who you are and whose you are. And for that, Lord, we just say thank you. We ask this prayer now. And the matchless, the marvelous, and oh, so magnificent name, Jesus, the living Savior, the bright and morning star, the wheel in the middle of the wheel, that sustains us every day. Let us all say amen and amen.
instead you have a program with a QR code on it which you can scan and read it at your leisure as well as the tributes which are contained therein. If you ever attended a session with Dr. Bertha, you know that she would start off giving honor to Mother, Father, God. So the first acknowledgement is to give God praise and thanks for her life. She would then follow by thanking and giving honor to the ancestors. So we now honor our ancestors. And then she would go into her spill of welcoming guests that were present, her immediate family, her friends, and anybody who knew her or who had made things possible in her life. So we welcome all of you and we thank you for being here. She loved her church and her pastor. On behalf of, on her behalf, I want to thank the Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, her beloved pastor, Dr. Clifford A. Jones, Sr., Dr. J.R. Covington, Mrs. Caldwell, Mrs. Batoutier, and Mrs. Preddy, Mr. Frank McGinnis, the singers and the musicians, and every other member who in any way helped to put this service together. And we thank Stanley Graham, one of her former students, for his musical contribution just now of Amazing Grace. On behalf of her family members, who were the most precious to her, her daughter Tawana, her grandchildren, great-grandchildren, her bonus daughter Brenda, her beloved sister and brother Deborah Earl and Joe Earl, and the rest of the extended family, I thank all of you for your presence here today and your support during their time of bereavement. There are some elected officials from various offices with us today and we thank them for being here. Representatives of her alma mater, Johnson C. Smith University, are here. We thank you for your support. The University of North Carolina is well represented. University of North Carolina at Charlotte, they would be mad with me if I didn't get that right, uh, are here and we thank you for your presence, your kind words and your support of Dr. Bertha. Her SARARs of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, including its international president, Mrs. Elsie Cook Holmes, seven past presidents, their executive leadership, the regional and local SARARs are here today. Over the years, they provided friendship, love, and support, which she enjoyed and cherished tremendously. For that, we thank you, for you meant so, so much to her. Her blood ran Delta Red. She was proud to be a member of the Lynx, and her friendship with her Lynx sister meant the world to her. We thank you for being here. Dr. Roddy's urn was designed and created by an internationally recognized wood artist, Charles Farrar, who generously donated this beautiful turn, wood-turned vessel in tribute to Dr. Roddy. Now, many of you consider yourselves to be special or extra special to Dr. Roddy, referring to her as Mama, Mama Bertha, or Mother Bertha, or to yourselves as her daughter, or a Bertha girl, or Bertha babe. Now, there are too, too many of you to name. You know who you are. You meant a lot to her. Thank you for being there for her in your special way. We thank Dr. Rico Wagner and Heritage Home Health Agency for providing caregivers, Hazel Davis, DeShaney Green, Chantel Cooper, Sandy Greer, Simone Moody, and Michelle Roseborough, who cared for her as they would their own mother. A special thanks goes to Ms. Nova Evans and Alice Outlaw, who were the last two of her caregivers. These caregivers, not just caregivers, but 
truly her friend and people who loved her, helped Dr. Roddy to live her final days in comfort and equally important to me, in dignity. Carolina Caregiving Hospice Services also assisted, and for that we are grateful. I must give particular appreciation for the special love, care, devotion, compassion, and companionship shown to her over the years, and particularly in the years of her declining health, by Barbara Washington, Stephanie Crawford, Gwen Marseille, David and Jackie Sanders, and Christine, or as we call her, Cookie Irving. Finally, I want to say that Dr. Bertha would have me express appreciation to all of you who knew her, but who because of circumstances beyond your control did not have the privilege or the opportunity to attend universities or join sororities or other civic organizations for your friendship to her. In her eyes and heart, you were treasured as well. Now, I know that some of you will have a lot of commentary about this service, and you will say, oh, they should have done this and they should have done that. And for somebody of her statue and prestige, there should have been a big blowout. Well, please know that these ceremonies today were dictated, not suggested, dictated, by Dr. Bertha Maxwell down to the minute details. So they are doing what she said should be done. And if any of you have any concerns about the simplicity of these services, I invite you, the next time you see Dr. Bertha Maxwell Roddy, you tell her. <laughs>
Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and Jesus Christ, his Son, our living Lord and our reigning and supreme Savior. Would you please bow your heads with me? Father, as you and your Son and Spirit are one, Please allow your servant, your word, and wisdom to become one, that we may affirm the eminence of your kingdom, the power of your spirit, and the lordship of your son. I trust you now. Guide my mind and my mouth, that I may be able to think your thoughts and clearly articulate your words. Touch, strengthen, and save. In accordance to your will for us this afternoon, in Jesus' name, amen. We have gathered, we've been assembled this afternoon to celebrate the gift given Lent to all of us for a season. And there's no real or easy way to say goodbye. I, to the family, to all of you, I know it's taxing, um, but you thank God for the gift of giving. I know it was a sacrifice because uh, mom, grandmom, sis loved her work and worked her work and possibly a bit of a workaholic. And there were times that you probably thought she should have been with you, holding you and all that other kind of th those things that you thought she should have been doing. Uh, I, yeah, I'm on your street. Uh, she did what she did, loved what she did. And all of us in Charlotte, North Carolina, and globally are better because of her. So feel good about the sacrifice that you made and that she made for the larger global community, okay? Uh, so you thank God for the gift. To the Reverend clergy, uh, those who are here, to Dr. Michelle, Reverend Tyson, Reverend Covington, other clergy, I don't know if chaplain, uh, McKenzie, Murphy McKenzie is here. If not, uh, is she here? Yeah, she is. Good to see you. And thank you. Uh, may the Spirit of Christ bless you as well. I've got to call out my sister. Uh, God's gift to us and another global gift in the person of Sister Bishop um, McKenzie. Uh, to all the past presidents, uh, no, no, former presidents, past or going, yeah, former presidents, to all of you who are here and to my sisters of Delta Thigma, Sigma Theta. Uh, good to see all of you. And if you have a chance, go down in the North X, uh, the East Plaza, our quilting ministry. They took down all the quilts, all the quilts, and put up Delta quilts um, yesterday. Uh, didn't say, Pastor, is it all right? Pastor, what do you think? I walked downstairs, and all of those Delta quilts are all over the place. And then they had that quilt in the middle. Uh, that is supposedly a picture of Jesus uh, in Omega colors. Uh, and uh, I, I told him that that wasn't Jesus, that was Judas. Uh, and, uh, and we all had a big laugh, but you need to go see the work that they did in the display uh, in honor of the gift given to us in Dr. Roddy. We talked about this. Dr. Roddy and sometimes uh, uh, Sister Geraldine, the three of us, sometimes the two of us, we talked about this day. And uh, what we're doing today is a long way from the initial plan. The initial plan was the House of Prayer ban, a march down Beatty's Ford Road <laughs> with singing and dancing and a long, we talked about this and prayed. And sometimes she'd call me pastor, sometimes she'd say, Cliff, 
And uh, I said we wouldn't go have no four or five hour funeral, about 45, 50 minutes, but Cliff. And uh, so we've come a long way. And uh, I find it interesting uh, that Attorney Sumter, did you hear her last words after she talked? Uh, never knew how much time that she was given, but she told me she had 10 minutes. So I guess they had worked that out. That's what she told me. But did you, did you recall the last words that she said before she sat down? Let me refresh your memory. You remember what you said? If you have any issues with what we've done in this program, when you see Bertha, you ask her. Did, was she throwing off that some of y'all going to die before she does? And that when y'all see her, y'all get that straight? Uh, I, I listen carefully to what people say to all of you. It's good to be here and uh, to all of our elected officials. I see all of you. Thank you for coming and sharing the day and uh, sharing this time with us. Be patient with me for a couple of moments. Uh, I won't be too terribly long, but I won't see y'all Sunday, most of y'all, and so I don't need to take any chances of uh, uh, y'all not, uh, me not getting the word in for the Lord. Uh, amen. I'm not, you know, some of y'all I may not see, uh, and some of y'all may just find it convenient not to be in church Sunday morning. You know, it's cool. It is. So I better not let this window of opportunity that the Lord and Dr. Bertha provided just ease away from us. I want to raise a couple of questions and make a couple of statements in the remarks. Scriptures have already been read um, from Micah and 1 Corinthians by the minor prophet and by the apostle named Paul Tarsus. Um, I want to weigh a couple of things together for our hearing and hopefully for our edification. Because I'm afraid that so often in funerals, we talk more about death and we don't spend enough time in talking about life. I'm reading this wonderful book, uh, Bishop uh, Vastai, by an A.E. Taylor, written in 1947 in the Cambridge um, Intellectual Series, written in the 40s. And the title of the book is The Christian Hope of Immortality. Stay with me for a moment. The Christian Hope of Immortality. Um, and the argument that he makes in these 128 pages, no bullet points. He's arguing that there is a possibility that um, annihilation, death, does not equate to non-existence. Say that another way. It's not true that when you're dead, you're done. It's not over. The text even says after death in the judgment. So we have that. But, but, but he's arguing that when the preacher has said earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust, that the God of the universe who spoke into the nostrils of dust that became a living soul, returns back unto the Lord. But then he says that there's that argument that there is something that exists in the universe after death. As long as you live and have memory, Dr. Bertha Maxwell Rodder will be alive. Are y'all listening to me? As long as you pass it down to your children, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and talk about her, she will always be alive. But there's another side that says that there's, a, that there's something that God has given that death cannot take and keep. And he talked about this A.E. Taylor, um, isolation. 
uh, origination <laughs> and finality. And it says, for every sunrise, there's always a sunset. For every morning, there is, you know it, an evening. For every life, there is, in time, a death and a passing. For every joy, there is a sorrow. For every today, there was a yesterday, and hopefully, there will be a tomorrow. He talked about and raised a seething question for me in that little 128 pages, I'm not quite finished yet, about the hope, the Christian, listen, Christian hope of immortality. Do, do, do you hear? Do, do, do you hear the question that's posed to Jesus? If a man dies, shall Job, he live again? Mary talking to Jesus. If, my, if you had only been here, my brother wouldn't have passed away. He talked about and asked a question. He said, what does it mean to be alive? Without your trappings, without the crowd, <laughs> without all your stuff, with that whatever it is that makes you happy and feel alive. If you take all of those things away, he says, talk to me about alive. Are you alive? Oh, don't tell me you're inhaling and exhaling. Don't tell me you are existing. A stone exists. A rock exists. A tree exists. I wonder if trees have feelings. I hope so, because I've got a tree in my yard that every now and again, I, I have to go out and hug my tree. I, I'm all right. Uh, I'm not on my meds. I, I, I'm all right mentally. But, you know, it's just something when I go outside and I put my arm around my oak tree and talk to my tree. Seems like that tree understands. Doesn't question my motive. Doesn't put me on a guilt trip. Don't tell me it's my fault. <laughs> Uh, don't tell me about when I was a young man and if uh, you reap what you sow. My tree don't tell me none of that stuff. But my tree is always there. When the storms of life are raging, my tree still stands. The question, what does it mean to be alive? That's what I want to raise with you. Uh, are you alive? Can you say, I am alive, I, I feel good, I, I've got some aches and pains, can I push you a little bit? I'm alive, I've got some shoes on my feet that are killing me, and I can hardly wait to get back to the car to pull them off, but I am alive. Somebody looked at their feet and you know, you know you're right here. They look good, just look at it and say you're hurting, but you do look good. <laughs> are you alive? Or are you waiting until you go to heaven to live? Don't tell me, brother, that you existed. Man, I'm making it. Mm, you ain't alive. Two things that I'm going to say about that, then I'm going to move on. Are you alive? Are you enjoying the life that you have? You only have one and you only have yours. You can't live anybody else's life. You, 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 you talk to me all you want to but you cannot live someone else's life for them. They only have one, you only have one, and you only have one chance with the one life that you have. Are you alive? And death and dying, funerals are reminders that this physiology, this flesh will return from dust thou art and to the dust thou shalt return. Not if, but when. To say E. Taylor pushed us to talk about the importance of being alive. Two points I want to make from one from Micah, one from 
First Corinthians. Are you familiar with, in memorandum, Alfred Lord Tennyson? 19th century, well-known Victorian poet. He has written that long, luminous poem. And I, I pulled it up and I, I said I was going to, I, I was led to just say a word about it. Um, of course, he talks about life in this 19th century. Let me just read a couple of verses. And it's long, but it's so fresh. Strong son of God, immortal love, whom we that have not seen thy face, by faith and faith alone we embrace, believing where we cannot prove, thine are these orbs of light and shade. Thou madest life in man and brute, Thou madest death, and lo, thy foot is on the skull which thou hast made. Thou wilt not leave us in the dust. This is Tennyson. Thou madest man. He knows not why. He thinks he was not made to die. And thou hast made him. Thou art just. I would I had time to read all of this. Thou seemest human and divine. The highest, holiest manhood thou. Our wills are ours. We know not how. Our wills are ours. To make them thine. The latter part of that introduction talks about forgiveness. What does it mean to be alive? One, to be in relationship to God. Remember the reading in Micah? What does the Lord require? Every one of us is a gift from God. And whether you agree, disagree, like or don't like, doesn't matter. Every one of us will give an accounting to God for the life that God has given you for the season in which you've lived. I don't believe that, Reverend Joe. This doesn't change the fact. That there are divine expectations for those of us who live. To whom much is given, much is also required. Sister was given a lot, a lot was required, she gave a lot. Left her life. What does the Lord require? A lot of sacrifices. And you, you've heard the verses. You, you've heard it over and over again. What does the Lord, to be alive, to be alive and, and to be in relationship to God, what does God require of me? Not my mama, not my grandmama, not my sis, not my friend, but what does God require from each of us? I'm afraid we're on very hard times here. Because we seem to be living in a world where people don't believe nor care what God requires. Every time I hear of a shooting and a stabbing, um, somebody has forgotten that God requires something from us and that we will be accountable to God for how we've lived our lives and treated one another. What does God require? Um, Pastor Jones, you just up there talking and making up stuff and, and, and I want some fries and uh, he has told you, old mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of Notice you to do justice. Hello? To love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. To love kindness. Be kind to one another. Talk to me, somebody. 
You may not think you need anybody today, but if you stay here long enough, you're going to need somebody in your life to help you. Love, kindness is always right to do right. When you don't have, when it's not reciprocated, that should not stop you from doing right. Be kind. If you want to be alive, be kind. Enjoy doing things for other people, though they won't do anything back for you. Hello? Don't do good just because you want them to do good for you. When you know that they're not going to do right, do good anyhow. It never hurts. You never lose by doing right and being kind to one another. We grew up with that. As we grew up with that in our history. Didn't have much, Dr. Thomas, so good to see you. Didn't have much shotgun houses and, and slop jars. Talk plain, Clifford Jones. Pumps outside and clothes hanging up on a nail on the living, on, on the bedroom door. Three and four sleeping in the same room. Three in the same bed. Mama cooking out of one pot. But somehow there was kindness. Didn't have to lock your doors with an alarm system with a beware dog sign when you didn't have a dog at all. We've lost that. We're losing that. We're not kind enough to one another. We didn't grow up like that. Hello. A joy. What does the Lord require? You want to be alive? Do what the Lord requires. And then it won't be so difficult for just judges and just and honest attorneys. <laughs> you can read between the lines. I don't know if, uh, if a certain person had been poor and black, they would have been in jail years ago but they're still flying all over the country. But that had been a black person, I'm, I'm, you, you may not like it, but if that had been Boo Boo from the hood, Boo Boo would have had life in prison with no bail and no, and no exit. And some of y'all running around following it. Be careful with that. Don't become political, Cliff Jones. Preach your sermon. Stop. Be careful. What does the Lord require? Because when we leave this place, it's not over. Are some of you old enough to remember uh, in our community uh, when someone would pass away? I remember that little boy. I used to hear old folks saying, they're leaving us, but they're making room for somebody else. Some of y'all ever hear that? That that was, and, and, and for the ancestors, you, you didn't give a name that nobody could pronounce and nobody could spell. You were named after an aunt that had deceased or a cousin or a grandfather or a grandmother because there was that intent of remembering and being in contact with the ancestors. There was that belief, even in dreams. At the elders, have you ever had one where a parent has come back or somebody came back and told you something? There was that belief. There was that contact. There was that understanding that death didn't separate us. We were just in a different existence, but not annihilated. Second thing, and I stop now. You really want to be alive? and enjoy your life. Faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest is what? Love. Got the love, first of all. Well, can I say it like that, Lord? Well, I think you ought to love Jesus first, but, but, but you gotta love yourself. If you look in the mirror and don't like what you see, you got a major problem. 
and it's more than the tint of your hair. <laughs> Hello? It's more than a pre-made up face. When you look in the mirror first thing in the morning with your garlic breath, <laughs> you got to look at it and smile and say, yeah, that's you. Hey, 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 that's you. But I love you to death because you're all that I have. I've got to love me because I am God's gift to me. And if I don't love me and like me and appreciate me, how can I expect somebody else to love me? Respect me and appreciate me. Paul the Apostle said, listen, you do have that hope of immortality. But while you are in transition, while the blood is still coursing, warm in your veins, while you're still clothed and in your, you know it, y'all could preach this, I see Sister Leek, she's over there preaching a sermon. A clothed and in your right mind with a reasonable portion of health and strength. Keep the Lord in front of you and love yourself and be grateful for the life that you have and live life today knowing that the day will surely come. Uh, 94 in June, if I read this correctly, June 10th would have been 94. 93 long years, but she's made her transition to the other side. Ah, it is true where the wicked have ceased from troubling, where the weary are at rest, where there are, where there is no longer a need for caretakers, where hospice doesn't exist. <laughs> where respite care is not necessary, where palliative care is not needed. On the other side, when you have put this dust back unto the dust, for from dust thou art, and to the dust thou shalt return. When you have put that back and you've eased on the other side to be with our creator, that's why the Lord reached back and told the disciples and said, listen, I'm going away, but I'm preparing a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. I'm right on the brink of Easter here. Ah, but, but you, you, you be where I am on the other side, in my father's house. There are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you. Love God. Don't keep putting that off. Make sure that the Lord Christ is the Lord of your life. Don't keep putting that off. And then in that relationship, live. Make life better, not only for yourself, but all around you. And love one another with utmost appreciation and utmost gratitude. For the Lord Jesus Christ has shown us the way and by faith, we must follow him and he will lead us to that God-blessed land. Thanks be to God for the gift given to us for a season. Thanks be to God. She's now at ultimate rest and peace with the Lord and at home. Is she dead? No, not dead. Body's gone. But as long as you live, she lives in your mind, in your heart, and in God's kingdom. And uh, that's enough. That's enough. Let's pray. Let's pray. We thank you. for the gift given to us for the season that the gift was given to us the gift and Bertha Maxwell Roddy you blessed all of us for 93 plus years she touched our lives and touched them in such a way that 
Communities are different. Cultural centers are there now that weren't there. African and Afro-American studies programs are in universities that weren't there. One of the most powerful organizations in the world had her as president and she made a difference, not only among them, but globally, where persons are living in habitat houses that cost 30, 40, 50,000 a bill that are now worth 200,000 plus for her caring, missional spirit. Thank you. For her caring for us so much that she planned what she wanted to happen today. Thank you for the gift given that we will always cherish and always nourish. Thank you for her Christian spirit. Thank you for Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who loves us. And he said, I will never forsake nor leave you. In fact, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. For such a gift given to the Roddy and Maxwell families proper, the family of Charlotte, and Mecklenburg, and North Carolina, and globally, for such a gift. We're humbled and we're grateful. Now help us, O oh Lord, as we live our lives to live and to live with the spirit of humility and honoring you and loving you and, yes, Lord, loving one another. For we ask this prayer with utmost gratitude and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. What will happen now is that as we prepare for our recessional, we will go down by the pond and we will have the committal service family. Uh, if y'all uh, got on some walking shoes, can y'all make it? Wanda, can you walk in those shoes, those shoes? Can you walk in those shoes, girl? Those, you got your walking shoes, you can make it in those shoes. I see you untying them. Yeah, there you go. I knew you were in here. Uh, put on your walking shoes if you have to. We're going to walk down and uh, do the ash ceremony and release the balloons and do the final committal. Um, morticians, you want to come forward now as we prepare? And then after the family recessionals, uh, then in our own way, we can be dismissed and share together. Okay, you can put the babies in the bassinet. You all want to get all of that ready now? Get the babies ready so you can roll down? Okay. Yeah, they want to walk and run around. Those that can't let them walk and get up a little bit. They've been very patient. Thank you, family. Okay, give them another minute or two to sort of get together. That beautiful urn, Dr. Roddy had that made. And that urn, Sister Geraldine, this has been made, what, a couple of years or more now, the urn? Over two or three years ago, she had it designed and made. Uh, she was a planner and prepared, and we thank God for her. Okay, would you please stand? Family, we're ready. Y'all ready? Okay, we'll walk slow. We'll walk slow, don't worry. Y'all can just follow. Clergy. If not, just keep, you can wait. Just be seated. Don't feel like you have to do that. Put to quite a few steps. That's too much. If you want to go, you won't go. 
good to see you. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior. Because I can face because he lives. All fear. Because I know. dismissed and may the peace of the Lord be with you. Bye.